All right, good morning. Glad to have or see all of you. What, what you all probably do not know is, is um, since this whole thing began, uh, the little camera that's on your computers, we've been watching you if you've been watching us. So we can tell um, we have all manner of array of individuals coming to church in all manner and fashions and, and those kind of things. Now before you get carried away and go get a piece of tape and cover up the camera... I'm just kidding. I'm clowning around a little bit. Some uh, conspiratorial theorist will come out now that the churches are now watching you at the service. I'm reminded uh, years ago I lived with an elderly lady and uh, her favorite song that she used to sing, especially when she thought I was up to something I shouldn't be, she'd sing, watching you, watching you, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. And uh, sometimes I think we forget and we pay more attention to the fact that people are watching us than God's watching us. And God's watching us and God's watching what we're doing and how we're handling things and how things are going uh, in the current situation. I want you to know clearly that uh, this thing didn't come upon God as a surprise. He knew it was coming. It is a worldwide thing. Um, There's some things I'll cover with today. Uh, Hopefully it'll give you a little bit of answers on that, but... Just suffice it to say, you know, is this the end? No, it can't be the end. The rapture hasn't occurred. The judgment seat of Christ hasn't occurred. The tribulation hasn't occurred. The uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb hasn't occurred. The battle of Armageddon hasn't occurred. The judgment of nations hasn't occurred. The millennial reign of Christ hasn't occurred. The battle of Gog and Magog hasn't occurred. The great white throne hasn't occurred. So no, there's no way uh, that it's the end. Uh, is it going to be for the rapture? Well, I sure hope so. I'd be a real blessing that it was. Uh, maybe uh, we get a Pentecost rapture or the uh, that would be a great thing or maybe the, the same day that the Lord ascended and led captivity captive, maybe we go out. I can't say that for sure. I'm not setting a date. Don't go out and say that I am, but I'm looking for the rapture. I do have this concern about that and that is is that there are people now looking for the rapture to escape a virus when before they weren't looking for the rapture because they had another ball game to play or another business to get or a car to buy or house to buy. And now the economic situation doesn't look good and people are uh, struggling with the virus and those kind of things. And so now you're hearing a lot of talk from people who never talked much about the rapture. Now they're talking about the rapture. But I'm glad they're talking about the rapture. Uh, What's going to happen? I have a simple answer to that. I have no idea. Uh, I'm not real smart on a whole lot of things, but I'm smart enough to not speak to things. I have no idea what's going to happen You live in a day and time where people, because of the social media platform and YouTube and all the other things, that people speak as if they become authorities on certain matters. Uh, There are certain matters I don't know anything about, and it's better for me just not to say anything about it. You can do what you want to, but, but I would maybe caution you that some of the people that you listen to verify the information that you're getting from the individuals and then put it to wherever you're living Uh, We've gotten a few phone calls from some people that disagree with what we're doing, but they're not in the same set of circumstances that we're in, don't have the same mayor, don't have the same sheriff, don't have the same uh, situation and circumstances. I can't tell somebody out in Colorado what to do or California to do or up in Michigan what to do or North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Virginia. I, I have to do what's going on here so what is going to happen with all this? I have, I have no idea. Well, preacher, you know, they opened it up too fast and you were complaining that it wasn't open fast enough and there was nothing to it. And now all of a sudden it's, well, maybe it's a little too fast and if we go back then there's going to be a major collapse and then everything's going to shut down. Or they should have opened it a long time ago. We, we should have heard about it long before we heard about it. Well, they should have done this. See, criticism is an easy thing to do. A criticism is enabled that before you have to be responsible for the information that you give, before you have to be responsible for the decision that you make, you get to see somebody else make a decision and then you can armchair quarterback it. And that's what we used to call people. You used to hear it on Sundays and on uh, when they get together about the college ball games. Well, you know, if I was the coach, I would have told the quarterback to run this and that and the other. And if I was a defensive coordinator, I would have told him to do this or that or the other. And you don't have the responsibility. The game's already over. You could see the play he ran didn't work. 
And so all of a sudden you criticize you because your favorite team lost. Well, a lot of that's going on nowadays. The same thing happens from what I used to do and what the, the uh, policemen and women do nowadays uh, currently. They have to make split-second decisions and then have what they decided to do, drug out in court or drug out in front of a review board that has an opportunity to stop time and look into that microcosm of time and say, well, now if, and, you know, and then play the whole thing out. I was involved in a review board one time, and one of my guys got into a situation where a guy tried to run over him, and uh, and he you know took the necessary action, and I believe he took the necessary action in a split second. In a split second, he had to make a decision. I watched him kick that thing around that table four times in over an hour and a half, four times. Well, I think if I'd have been there, you weren't there. Well, you know, back in the day when I did, this ain't back in the day, this is now. Well, you know, maybe there was an exit strategy and maybe he could have done outrun a 60 mile an hour car. I, I mean, it just kept going and going and going because they stopped time. You're in a situation you have to make a decision. Now, your governmental officials, officials, whether they're smart or not smart, whether they're idiots or not idiots, you show your own ignorance when all you can do is criticize a decision that has already been made. So I'm positive when the thing gets passed or if it creeps back up again or whatever, there's going to be some among the brethren. And what they're going to say is, you know, well, see, they were wrong because they didn't shut down. Well, see, they were wrong because they did shut down. Well, see, they were wrong. And they're going to kick that thing around the court because you don't have all the information. Make the decisions based upon where you are and what you're doing and have the, 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 the intestinal fortitude to be able to stand by your decision. It may not be after you get more information. You might have to actually change some things. But make the decision based upon the information you have and quit worrying about somebody that's 3,000 miles away telling you what you should do in your town, telling you what you should do with your family, telling you what you should do as far as your business or your job, telling you what restaurant you ought to go to and who you ought to see and whether you should or shouldn't go to the beach and all that other stuff. Learn to make your own decisions and be responsible for them. But don't get known as a critic. Uh, because all a critic is, is he's had the information now and saw where things didn't work out. Well, it's easy to jump on it then and criticize it when there's no responsibility for the outcome of that decision. So what's going to happen? I couldn't tell you. Is it a setup for the Antichrist? I've gotten that probably, oh, I'd say conservatively a dozen times this year. Very well could be. Uh, the computer, when the web came on, you know, the web, get caught in the web, and uh, the number for the web is 666, and the number for the barcode is 666, and I mean, I think the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, has been here since Jesus was here. Judas Iscariot was here. Have I not chosen you 12? One of you is the devil. That's in John chapter 6, verse 70. That's a 13 that's there. I think that uh, the Antichrist platform is here now whether or not it's going to be setting up for the mark of the beast and they're going to put in some kind of a way to track you through an inoculation or, or whatever it may be and all that kind of... You jump into some conclusions really fast without having all the facts. I don't know if it's the setup for the Antichrist or not. It's worldwide. Could be. Maybe. Possibly. I don't have any idea. I know his letter is an X... I know his number, it's a 666. I know his, his name, I know where he comes from, I know a lot of things about him, but what is his actual name when he pops up? You know, I've heard everything from going, going way back to Khrushchev and going back to Hitler and going back to uh, Constantinople, going back all the way through to coming up through uh, to Stalin and, and uh, the guy with the map on his head, Gorbachev and Reagan, and then it was going to be the Bushes, and then it's Obama, and now it's Jared Kushner and, you know, the son-in-law of the current president and all those kind of things. Well, the fact of the matter is I have no idea who it is. If you figure it out, let me know. I've received papers, I mean literally dissertations, on why so-and-so is the Antichrist. I've heard everything from Mark Zuckerberg to uh, Jared Kushner to Donald Trump to uh, uh, President Obama and President, uh, um, what's the guy before him, Bush. I've heard all of that stuff. I have no idea who it is. The Lord hadn't showed it to me. If he showed it to you, praise the Lord. But is it the setup for that? It could be. But here's the thing you need to know about that, and I'll get to Timothy here in a second. Believe it or not, we're in 2 Timothy, and uh, I, this is the opportunity to kind of rant over the, what's happened during the past week and the information that I had. So you just be patient with me, if you would, please. You're rightly dividing your Bible. 
You have to understand that if it is the mark of the beast, by the time that guy shows up, we're gone. You don't change your doctrine. Doctrine, first application of Scripture. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine. Reproof and exhortation, etc., and so on and so forth, instruction and right. Doctrine, not much doctrinal stuff nowadays. Many of you are watching enough preachers nowadays to realize there's no anchor in doctrine, no foundation in doctrine at all. You don't change your doctrine to match the, the theology of the world. You don't change your doctrine because the headlines in the newspaper change. You don't change your doctrine because of a newscaster who came up with some kind of an information about this and that and the other. You don't change your doctrine because you're going to jump over into the revelation and try to grab the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You don't change your doctrine. Doctrine's set. These other things don't influence doctrine. And so don't be in such a big hurry to try to read into something that's something that's not there. I don't know whether or not this is the Antichrist set up or not. I know this. When he shows up, I'm gone. I know this. We're not in the tribulation. I'm wore out now with these preachers that are all of a sudden changing and, and they're changing their position. and They've always believed and always thought in the pre-tribulation rapture. But with much effort and much study and much prayer before God, God has revealed to them that they were wrong and that the church is going to go through the tribulation. Okay, well, you stay down here. I'm leaving. I tried last week. I was trying to figure out a way to do it. I don't know. We don't have the smoke and mirrors with a camera, but I was trying to figure out a way that all of a sudden the power went out, and when the power came back on, my Bible was here, my jacket was here, and, you know, try to give you the impression that the rapture happened and you got left behind. <laughs> that would have been a funny joke, I think, anyway. If I could have had Justin blow the horn, you know, in the background, and then all of a sudden, you know, it, it goes off. I think that would be funny. But you know what's starting to happen? You're starting to try to fill in the blanks. Years ago, a lot of years ago now, I hate to keep replying to uh, 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 but it was part of what I, it wasn't what I did, it was who I was. Uh, back years ago, this is long before a lot of the, the young guys that are around now, they don't even know where the stripes by the door are coming out. Next time you go on a stop and rob, you walk out by the door and on the right and left hand side, if they got the full package, but at least on one side or the other, they'll have a strip up there. And that strip will start right at about five feet tall and it'll run up to about six foot eight and it goes on the side of the door. It's a strip runs down the side of the door. The reason they did that is, is because you go in after somebody robbed them and you say, how tall was the guy? Well, if you were sitting down, you'd think he was seven foot tall. Did he have a gun? Yeah, he had a gun. It was this big. The barrel on that thing looked that big. Well, if it's pointing at you, it certainly gives you a different perspective. What, we, what happened was, as you go in there and they say, well, you know, what was he wearing? And now all of a sudden they've drawn a blank. They don't know, but they think they're supposed to know. So they say, uh, 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 it, it was blue jeans. You sure it was blue jeans? Could it have been sweatpants? Well, it could have been sweatpants. Well, was it sweatpants or was it corduroy pants? Well, well, it could have been corduroy pants. Do you remember the cover? Color? Well, I, I, I think they're blue. Could they have been black? Well, yeah, it might have been black. Could have been blue. But, I don't, but I'm not really sure. Well, okay, did he have a hoodie? Did he have what kind of a shirt did he have on? The, unless it was a stark color that stood out like red or something, they couldn't get the thing. What they're doing is filling in the blanks. They said, you know, it was a white guy that came in. He's about five foot six, and he came in. Only way I know he's about five foot six is when he ran out. It looked like that's where his ball cap was and that kind of a thing, and he had sort of a silver-looking gun. Do you know anything else about it? No. You have to stop right there. You say, why? He'll naturally try to fill in. The witness will naturally try to fill in the blanks. Now, here's what's happening, and I'm not getting on to you. It's, it's hard with a church full of pews and stuff and all. Here's what's happening, and a lot of you are doing it. You're trying to fill in the blanks. Where does this fit? And where does this fit? And how does that fit? And what about this? And what about that? If you have experience doing that stuff, help yourself because you have enough sense to keep an open mind and realize I'm just throwing out some ideas and thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Could be, could be, could be, could be. But some of you are looking for the period at the end of the sentence so hard, you're ignoring all the facts that are going on. There are a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes that you and I don't know anything about. You say, we have the government's clandestine. The government never tells us anything. The government's keeping everything. I'm not even talking about the government. 
I'm not talking about what your mayor or governor knows and what other people might know that are trying to prevent a mass panic going on or anything like that. I'm talking about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual weakness, rulers of darkness, and high place. Have you considered there's things going on spiritually right now that you don't have any concept about whatsoever? You don't even know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. You know what I see? I see a bunch of Christians. I can't judge the world. They're scared to death. They're in a panic. They're frightened. They don't know what's going to happen to their retirement. They don't know what's going to happen to their house. I, listen, man, I would be in a bad situation if I wasn't getting a paycheck and couldn't pay my mortgage. What if that were you? The price of putting food on the table or making a house payment or making a car payment and you hadn't had a job now for going on about five weeks. And Lord only knows how long if they open up, you know, you're qualified for phase one after two weeks of looking back and then you get in phase one. And if your numbers don't come up, then you can move from phase one to phase two. And then if the numbers don't come up, you can move to phase three. So immediately you go, okay, in six weeks we're back to normal. That's not what they said. You say, what's going to happen? It's going to go not just state by state. It's going to go county and county and city and city. And people have to make discernment or have some discernment about those things. You know what's beginning to happen? Certain individuals in the world are in a panic. But a Christian's not even considering the spiritual side to this. You're wrapped up in the here and the now. The My rights are being taken from me. Uh, let my people go. Let me out. Let me ha- let me. Suppose the Lord wants you sequestered. He did the nation of Israel. He held them captive for 400 years. He let Nebuchadnezzar come in and take them over because they were being rebellious and not doing what they were supposed to do. So don't tell me there's not a precedent for it in the Bible. Uh, They stayed over there after the Egypt deal over there, went into Canaan, and you know how the whole situation was there. And then they got out of balance. The Lord had Nebuchadnezzar come in there after he got him straightened out and sent him out into the wilderness out there. And his dew fell upon him and he grew like eagle's feathers on him, lycanthropy and... His fingernails and toenails, you know, grew out real long like an eagle's and that kind of a thing. And the Lord taught him a lesson out there. I heard one of the well-known, well-spoken uh, uh, individuals giving a, a press conference this week. Somebody sent me the clip from it. And in that clip right there, he said, you know, we've tamped down, we've brought down, we've, we've been managed to bring down the, the curve and that kind of a thing. And he said, uh, it wasn't because of the medicines and it wasn't because of this. And, and God didn't do it. That's what he said. And God didn't do it. He said, you did it. You people from this state, you did it. It's you get the credit. Well, buddy, I've got news for you. I wouldn't want to, for anything in this world, stand what looks to me like at the great white throne and give an answer for that right there. God didn't do it. Listen, if you did anything, saved or not, if God didn't do it, then you're hopeless. Uh, You know what they said? Well, the first thing came to my mind, and I sent back to a friend of mine. I said, that's the same thing they said about the Titanic, which, by the way, was sailing from overseas over to... uh, particular city over here and on the way they hit an iceberg you know what they said about that ship when they launched it they said even god himself couldn't sink this ship boy that's a bold statement boy that's a bold statement even god himself you know what you did you just elevated yourself to the level of god you know what you're saying we can build something god can't destroy that's a bold statement you say what is that that's you adjusting your doctrinal issues according to or based upon uh, uh, what's going on in the world today because you're looking for answers some things in the Bible you have to learn to accept by faith you won't ever get all the answers some things in the Bible you accept by faith some things in the world you have to admit I don't know what's going on I couldn't any more than a cat here tell you what's going on. All I know is I, if I die, like a lady, I'll tell you about it in the morning service, but a, a lady and her husband that came here to our church for a long time recently passed away. She got the virus down there, was on a ventilator for a short period of time, and then went on absent from the body and present with the Lord. You say, well, what, is that? what would matter to her? What do you think would matter to her? You ever ask yourself that? What do you think would matter to her? I mean, she couldn't even get a glass of orange juice from somebody that she knew. She couldn't see anybody. She's alone by herself. It's a good thing she was saved on a ventilator and passed away and not able to be around family, not able to be around friends. You say, oh, well, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, well, tough guy, tough girl, y'all go ahead. But uh, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have somebody with me when I go. 
unless it's something real quick. If I'm going slow, man, I'd like to just have somebody I know to be there to hold my pinky or something or another. But the point I'm trying to help you to understand is, is there's a lot of unanswered questions that people are trying to answer and they don't have valid answers for them. As a matter of fact, if when my old, uh, uh, what I used to do, if that was in a court of law, before you could even get it out of your mouth, there's two things. Number one, you'd hear a loud objection and number two, he's testifying as an expert and he doesn't have the credentials as an expert. And now you've got a bunch of people that are acting like experts in political matters and in matters of personal prejudice and in matters of this is what I think and this is what I feel. Uh, This is the end of times and this is how it's going to be and all that. Okay, objection. Based on what are you making that statement, that supposition? Answer, you don't have an answer. You have gone out and read all the conspiratorial websites and you've read all the places and looked at all the stuff and you've listened to a bunch of talking heads on the news media that couldn't even qualify as experts in a court of law. You're listening to people give you doctor's opinions and military opinions and things and they don't have captain or general or major or something in front of their name. Just people talking, just talking, talking. They're paid to talk and writing. And getting in front of the camera, and nowadays, you know what we have? We have a bunch of preachers. We have a bunch of Christians. And what they're doing is, is they're coming up, throw the rightly dividing right out. Well, this is what I think it is, and I think it's this, and I think it's that. I should have, five weeks ago when this thing started, started writing all of it down to then hold the thing up and say, well, what happened to all this? You said this was going to happen. In the Old Testament, if you were a prophet, they'd stone you. Why do you have to try to speak? Number one, is this the end? No. Number two, is it the rapture? Well, I can only hope for that, but I've been hoping for that since before 1988 with Wizenut. 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 88. Uh, What's going to happen? I don't have any idea. Is it the setup for the Antichrist? Could be. Are they tracking me? Probably. If they want to. But what are you doing worth tracking? Are you such a bold witness for Jesus Christ that they're worried about that? Or are you doing something illegal? Yeah, they're probably tracking you. They're probably profiling you. Uh, let me ask you a question. If you want to rebel, you want to come against the government, you've got to take Paul's position. You know what Paul says? Paul said, after I've done anything worthy of death, then let me die. Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Goes to jail, got beat up and goes to jail. You know what happened to the Apostle Paul? Same thing. We'll talk about that this morning. He goes to prison for the right reasons. Are you sure you're going for the right reasons? Are you sure you're not just looking for a reason to rebel? You're sure you're not just looking... Did you look at who some of the people you're joining up with that have that in common? Here's an amazing thing to me, and I apologize again for getting a little frustrated. Some of you folks have uh, separated yourself from a lot of these whack-a-moles that are out there, but now all of a sudden, because you're... Uh, freedoms, your rights have been infringed upon and you have been uh, not able to do what you used to do. You look at who you're joining up with now. You look at who you're having the same battle cry about. Now, if that's the hill you want to die on, help yourself. You know, well, preacher, I can go far down the road with anybody as long as I don't compromise. Okay, you're also known by the company you keep. How about that? How about you're with a bunch of people that don't believe the Bible, or they don't love Jesus, and they don't go to church, and they don't have any spiritual sense to them at all. All they are is about the United States Constitution, and some of you, uh, some of you folks are in the process now of raising your voice louder now than you ever raised your voice when you didn't even have this as an issue. Some people are more worried about not gathering in church, and it's odd because they weren't in church to begin with. It's their cause they hide their rebellion behind. Now look at who you join up with. I know of a couple of guys that I know that I know pretty well, and they used to preach against all these people that they're joining hands with now, and and saying, well, it's okay, you know, because uh, we've we've had our rights impinged. Our rights haven't been impinged. They're trying to protect me. They say, you know what I do? They ask me, could you please do it this way? We can do it this way without compromise. But let me just make sure you clearly understand. If they finally come up and say, you can never do that again, they're going to have to also stop the restaurants and stop the schools and stop the businesses and stop everything else. And if that happens, then okay, fine. We'll take our lumps and we'll start doing it. But I'm not going to endanger people just because I'm worried about my reputation. I'm not going to endanger people because I finally get an opportunity to be bold for Christ. You're not being bold for Christ. You're being bold about your rights. And so now I get preachers that are, well, they're not meeting their apostate. 
They're not meeting because, you know, apostates love live feed. I can't stand this junk. I get wore out with it. I'm as tired of it as you got to be tired of it. I'm wore out with having to broadcast stuff and have two or three guys in here to help you. And you get the same old monotonous baloney. I miss the gathering. I miss every one of you in here. And yes, I'm looking at you while I'm here because I can see where you're sitting in here. It helps me to be able to try to, to be a little bit more fluid and not bore you to tears. I'm wore out with this. Don't ever get this idea. Oh, this is the rage of the age. This is the way we're going. It's going to be this way from now on. Not for me, it's not. Not for me, it's not, but I have enough sense to hunker down in a hurricane. I have enough sense to hunker down in a tornado. I have enough sense if I have the flu when I'm at home to stay away from people. I have enough sense if they're recommending this that I can do it without compromise. They have yet to tell me I can't preach Jesus. So if you want to use me as your subject for your sermon today, go ahead and help yourself. You know, I'm, I'll be your sermon topic. What a boring subject that is. I'll do what I need to do for my folks that are here. You do what you need to do for your folks wherever in the cat hair you are. I'm going to do what I need to do to protect my wife and my family. You do what you need to do and we'll let God sort it out. In the meantime, in the meantime, don't try to read into the headlines something that's not there. And because you say, what happened? You wind up losing your credibility. Now, I grant you, there are some people doing some odd, weird, unusual, strange, way off the the charts for me, and I don't know if I was where you are what I would do, but I'm not where you are. So I don't know what will happen here. And if they all of a sudden put the, you know, the, the stop to us being able to do this, well, then we'll have to make some decisions when it comes to that. And if after all these years you don't know what side of that line I would fall on, then you hadn't been paying attention. You're just trying to use me as your subject. Notice what he says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I'm not quite done with a rant yet, but I've got to get a little bit of Bible here. But in a great house, verse 20, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver and vessels of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor honor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared to every good work. Now, the vessel unto honor means you have to depart from iniquity. Watch what he shows you. It means you have to depart from iniquity. It means you have to purge yourself from dishonorable things. That means you have to separate yourself from people that are not of like mind and like faith. You have to separate yourself from people that are living after this world and and doing certain things as far as the world is concerned. Look, if you will, in verse number 22, flee also youthful lusts. You know what he's doing? He's bringing it right down to a practical situation. He's saying, listen, flee the youthful lust. That goes without saying. You don't really need me to say much about that. You should pretty much understand it. But follow righteousness, faith, and charity, and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Did you notice the thing there? First of all, flee youthful lust. He's telling you to get rid of, purge some things, the verse before. He's showing you what those things are, false doctrine, false teachers, those kind of things up there, uh, an unclean house and that kind of stuff, if you follow me there. And then he said, but it's not just a purging. It's not just a cleaning out. It's not just to stop everything. It's start filling up with the right kinds of things. Uh, The biggest mistake that many Christians make, and they have to learn by experience, I guess, because the emphasis for so many years in our movement was stop, 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 stop. Quit, 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 quit. Don't, 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 don't. And what happened is, is we taught people how to stop sinning and we taught people how to quit, you know, wearing certain clothes and get haircuts a certain way and have dress length a certain way and do have makeup or don't have makeup or jewelry or not jewelry. It always seemed to focus more on women. It's a weird thing. But at any rate, uh, don't go to the movies and quit watching TV. TV or not TV, that is the question, you know, that kind of a thing. And don't do all this stuff. But we didn't teach them enough about filling up on the right stuff. So you have what's similar to a cavity in your spiritual life. You've dumped all this rotten stuff out, but if you don't put something in it... Now, nowadays, I think they use amalgam, or I don't think they use mercury anymore, but they, they fill that thing up. You say, why? They know that a hole that is left in your head will rot further. Well, in your spiritual life, just dumping a bunch of bad habits will set you up for a spiritual demise. You'll rot out your spiritual life. Didn't say you lost your salvation. You have to learn to fill yourself with the right things, with the right people, with the right company. Who doesn't know that? Who doesn't understand from reading Daniel that even dietary things matter? Not eating the king's meat, which has a a whole bunch of stuff that goes with that, and not drinking the king's wine and so on and so forth. He said, give us vegetables and water, pulse. He said, give us vegetables and water and that kind of a thing, and after 10 days, check us out. 
Well, I mean, that'd be a pretty boring diet, but the emphasis is there is eating what the world wants you to eat and eating what you need to eat for health. You can tell if I keep eating the king's meat, I'm not going to be as, uh, as strong as I ought to be physically. Now, spiritually, let's make an application. You keep a diet of the rest of the world. All the junk that's out there, it's going to rot you out spiritually. But if you also don't eat the right spiritual things, then you're going to rot yourself spiritually also. Those are things that protect you against doing the, the, the wrong kinds of things and putting the wrong kind of information in. So you could give uh, it to any Christian. Here's you some advice. He said, put off the old man, but notice put on the new man. That's found in Ephesians 3, that's found in Ephesians 4, and those passages there, when I purge, how do I purge? i got to put more Jesus in. That Bible says in John chapter number 3 and verse number 30, this is John the Baptist talking, and they get it backwards. They get it backwards. Probably came from an independent Baptist, because your history comes from Southern Baptists who got so far out on the limb with being liberal that we went the opposite direction. But the Bible says in John 3.30, open it up and check it, do something besides let it be a dust collector there. Open it up and check it. You know what it says right there? It says, He must increase. I must decrease. Here's how it's said nowadays. I must decrease so that He increases. No, what He's talking about is He continues to grow. He continues to grow. He continues to grow until He shoves you out of the way. Watch. Well, you have uh, Abel's over there worshiping God by the sacrifice he uh, offers. And then the Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was not. What does that mean? It means that Enoch got so full of the Lord that Enoch quit being Enoch. Enoch started being like the Lord. That comes from walking with the Lord. That comes from growing in the Lord. That comes from time in prayer and time in reading your Bible and time in prayer and, and, and listening to the right kind of music and listening to the right kind of songs and listening to the right kind of sermons and listen to that kind of stuff. Some of you folks, you, you're, you, it's amazing to me. Now all of a sudden we need God's help and you try to turn on the spiritual thing. You can't just turn it on. It's not like that. Salvation is like that. Salvation is, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe the Lord uh, uh, died, buried, and raised again the third day. I ask Him to save my soul. I ask Him to save my soul. Not come in my life. I ask Him to save my soul. He saved you like that. Spirituality requires effort. Requires you to work at it. Requires you to learn to get some good habits about you. you got habits now, don't you? I'm giving you right out of the Bible. He said, flee you for lust. You say, why? They'll get you in trouble. Get away from them. Stay away from them. When you're young, you do dumb things. You say, why? You're driven by the carnal man. You're driven by the natural man. You're driven by what's now, if you're saved, the old man. You know what he said? He said, get away from those things. But pursue... Seek after, look for, find the other things that he lists right there in the passage. Now here's the part that I wanted to get to today, and I don't know if I have time, and if not, I'll, I'll get to it a little bit later on. Uh, notice, if you will, in verse number 23. So he says, Flee youthful lust, and 22, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a good heart. Notice it's the right uh, communion, the right fellowship. Uh, just fellowship with anybody for anything is not the right thing for you to do. You should have the right balance on that by now. But notice what he says, verse 23, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. <laughs> Is that an understatement or what? That's an absolute understatement. That's going on right now. Look in Proverbs, if you will, please. Proverbs chapter number 18. Now, I'm not sure why they asked some of the questions that they ask. I remember the old preacher saying, Proverbs chapter 18, uh, he had a guy that uh, followed him to a couple of meetings and stuff, and I happened to be at the meeting, going to the meeting. My wife and I were there and, and those kind of things, and he would always have on Saturday mornings, he'd have questions and answers. And he'd say, and I'll do my best to answer your question from the Bible within five seconds. And this guy would stand up, and he'd ask some weird, whacked out, off the wall, uh, jacked up question that didn't affect anybody in the congregation at all. You know, uh, uh, questions about segregation and integration or second word can get his wife or our questions about uh, abortion and what happens to the fetus and is it a person or is it this and that and the other and but he'd be always the same question I watched him pause one time big crowd of people there's probably four or five hundred people in that place packed out wanting to hear the some new thing like the Athenians and all that and he said uh, uh, hang, hang on just a second there brother he said now I, I know that people he's, he's being tongue in cheek he said I know that people generally ask questions for three reasons. Uh, number one, they really want to know the answer. Number two, they want to know what the teacher knows. 
And number three, they want to show other people what they know. And then he paused for a second and he said, Now, what was your question? And the guy just sat down. Now, the point I'm making to you is, is that oftentimes these people are asking you these questions because they want to they raise their own reputation like they have some wisdom and something. You know what the Lord said? Avoid the foolish questions. You say, what do they do? They gender strifes. Some of the stuff that Bible believers... I'm not talking about the world. I'm not... I'm, can be concerned. This is written to save people. Some of the questions being asked today, they don't even deserve an answer. Uh, answer a fool, the Bible says, according to his folly. <laughs> and another place, he has give, given, given the other answer. But you have to know which one it is. You know what? I know this. Sometimes people act because they want to try to show their, how smart they are. Sometimes people do that way because they're rebellious. They want to have justification for what it is that they want to do. So they'll hide behind a question, their dislike, their distrust, their, their I even use the word hate for another teacher that taught them something different. And because of that, they want to show their own intellect. They see themselves as a, a Bible teacher. They see themselves as a preacher at the expense of always asking those unanswered or those esoteric, uh, they're just a fancy word for the, the opaque kind of questions that you can't really definitively nail it down. And boy, it sure makes them look really smart. And because you can't answer it, you're an idiot. And generally speaking, they will have a tendency to major on one thing. I don't have that liberty. I don't have that freedom. I don't have, there's another word I'm looking for, uh, but I, I don't have the ability to only major on one thing, or I could maybe become somewhat of an expert on it. But I have a congregation full of people of all walks of life, of all different varieties of things going on, of all different ages of things going on. And to minister to them, I have to try to my best to be widely read and to be prepared to feed everybody. Some cookies on the bottom shelf for the kiddies and some a uh, little bit of meat there for the, for the intermediates and then some strong knee, uh, meat for the giraffes. You can't just major on one thing. But these folks will come around and they major on one thing, one thing, one thing. They become an expert. That's always the question. It's like dealing with a Campbellite. Uh, you know, what about Acts chapter 238? I don't know. What about Genesis 1 1? <laughs> yeah, but in Acts chapter number 2, yeah, uh, they spoke in tongues. Who's the they? Well, the people that were gathered there. No, you got it wrong. Everybody heard in their own language. The only ones speaking were Galileans. You have to read a little bit further. Yeah, but the Holy Ghost fell upon them and it was a fire. No, it says like as a fire. Well, you know, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind and this and that and the other. Okay. And they were all sitting there. They weren't jumping up and singing kumbaya and roasting marshmallows around the fire. You say, well, preacher, you're a little bit jacked up this morning about it. I'm wore out with it, ladies and gentlemen. This is a test going on right now. You need to be settled. You need to be rooted. You need to be grounded. Nothing has changed except our environment. I mean, you got people that have come out of tornadoes and hurricanes and uh, house fires and terrible ungodly tragedies and things like that. And now what has changed doctrinally? Nothing. Nothing's changed doctrinally. What's going to happen? Nobody knows what's going to happen. Only God knows. I don't care who it is. I don't care if they're the brightest minds in the entire world. I don't care if Einstein was here right now, if that's who you hold up because of his 180-something IQ. If that's who, He couldn't tell you what's going to happen next. Nobody can. No Muslim, nobody of any other religion can tell you. Nobody but God can see into the future. No preacher can tell you where this is going. I can guarantee you this. One day you're going to die or you're going to be raptured if you're saved. And if you're not ready to hit the judgment seat of Christ, then Katie bar the door. Other than that, I can't tell you whether it's going to rain this afternoon or not. Well, the weatherman says, what does that mean? Well, the prediction is, what does that mean? But you have to kind of reel it back in. Now he says, foolish and unlearned questions, he said, avoid. Can you bear with me for a second? Look in Proverbs 18. Through desire, that's a dangerous thing if you're not careful with it. Desire can get you in a lot of trouble. Through desire, desire to, to investigate. A desire from the, uh, comes from the heart, not from the mind. Desire can be subjective and is generally egotistical. Desire leads a man to live a life of a recluse or being isolated from anybody that doesn't agree with with him. Desire leads to superiority above others and fancies that he is above the masses of quote common people end quote. Desire is not really seeking wisdom. He's seeking and intermeddling with wisdom. His love of wisdom is neither pure nor objective 
as I'm going to show you in a second. It's all about what is best for me. I'm coming up with some new thing. I've learned something new. I've seen something nobody else has seen. I've studied all the greats and, and I've, I've studied this. I studied something that uh, Dr. Ruckman or Brother Donovan or whoever other great Bible teacher is. That I'm, there's hundreds of them out there. Uh, whoever you fill in the name of whoever it may be. Uh, I, I found something they didn't find. And so then you wind up writing your papers on it and writing this. And then it upsets you when the mainstream doesn't accept it because it wasn't mainstream doctrine. It's something that you twisted and turned. And when somebody comes at you with truth, you say, oh, I, 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 they just don't like me. No, we're talking about your paper. And your paper is not doctrinally sound. That's just your opinion. No, there's the scripture right here. But now all of a sudden, you find the root of you writing that had to do with you and your reputation because your desires whacked out. Notice what he says in verse number 1. Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh an inner minute, separated himself. I'm above everybody. I know more than they do. I know as much as they do. Why do they get all the accolades? Why do they get all the advertising? Why do people think they're such great uh, individuals and all? Time proves a lot of things. The Bible says, through desire, a man, having uh, separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Seeks wisdom and intermeddleth. What does that word mean? To meddle in the affairs of other people which one has no concern whatsoever. To intrude into the business to which he has no right, nor does he have their credentials. Uh, not trying to find the truth, trying to find something that you can support with their way of thinking. Uh, and to excuse to do or to believe what they want to do. Notice what he says. Wisdom and intermeddle with, excuse me, with all wisdom, a fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Uh, there's no real desire to anything when they're studying that except to vaunt themselves, raise themselves, magnify themselves, raise their status, and now all of a sudden because they have a, oh, I don't know, a YouTube channel and they got 5,000 people watching them, well then they must be. Okay. Your measuring stick there is numbers. The very thing you used to preach against is now all of a sudden the measuring stick by which you see success. Well, Jesus must not have been very successful. He didn't have your kind of numbers. Well, he didn't have what we have nowadays. Now, he just had the Holy Spirit and a bunch of 11 misfits. But he did a pretty good job. You're still talking about him. Uh, people talk about a lot of times, you say, you give honorable mention on a regular basis to the old preacher. Sure I do. He taught me. He helped me. He, 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 he was a blessing to me. And time has proven he was right. Well, but what about this? What about this? He's dead. Why are you still worrying about it? Uh, I guess so you think they're going to continue, continue, excuse me, to talk about you the way that they talk about you uh, right now. Do you think after you're dead they're going to continue to talk about you? Let me give you one more verse. I've got to close down here. Look in the book of Romans. I'm talking fast enough that you have to have had a couple of cups of coffee to be able to, to keep your eyes open here because he's preacher's moving on too fast right now. Well, wait till you hear church. Come, if you will, please, to Romans chapter 3. Now, we're talking about the, the striving here. Verse number 23, it's a relief. I don't have to answer every question. That's the Genesis 3 society. It's to justify oftentimes their own sin. They won't admit they're bitter and they're angry and they're frustration. I know a couple of guys right now, they're so bitter at that preacher that's been dead now for a couple of years. They're so mad at him. They're so mad at some things that Brother Lent said. and He's been gone 15 years now. They're so mad about that stuff. They're writing papers today and writing books today because when they were around, they weren't getting the recognition from them. And so out of that bitterness, all that poison comes forth. And if you read enough of the other material you know exactly what they're refuting when they write their material. It's not an original thought in the bunch. Not an original thought. It is just a dissertation against somebody I don't like. There's YouTube videos that are out there now. Uh, somebody comes in and they move into a town and they are going to call themselves a preacher or a pastor. And then what they do is, is they go through and take pot shots and take snippets and take clips from places and preachers. And they run that out there and say, this guy's an idiot and 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 this guy's an idiot. And, an idiot and because of his style of doing things. Okay, well, who doesn't know I'm an idiot? You say, what have you? I've said before, an animated dirt ball, just a pipe for the Lord to run the message through. But here's the thing you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody that makes a name for themselves by destroying the integrity or the reputation of somebody else is a no-name anyway. 
Make your own name. Make your own way. Compete fairly. Uh, don't get out there and say, you know, well, I, I, I could beat them, you know. Well, you ain't even going to get on the field. Well, boy, if I was a policeman, you ain't going to go through the academy. You probably couldn't even pass the background ex- uh, uh, investigation. Well, if I was building that house, go get you a contractor's license and let's see what kind of house you would build. You're not going to do it. You're just going to be a critic. That's cheap stuff. And when those people come at you, they come at you with the, you know, where did Cain get his wife kind of stuff. I don't know. Why don't you read your Bible and find out for yourself? I know that's a harsh answer. But generally, people that ask questions like that, they don't go to church, they don't read their Bible, they don't pray, you know. Tithing's not in the New Testament. Okay, have a nice day. Don't tithe then. Why, why is that your question, you know? Jesus drank wine. Where, where, why would you be asking a question like that and you don't need to feel uh, the, the, uh, the responsibility answered? All right, now, here comes the coup de gras, here comes the catch-all, here comes the, the crescendo, here comes the, uh, the period or the exclamation point at the end of the sentence, and then I'll sign off here for about 10 minutes. It'll be a good time. If you want to have a song service, you can have it at home. And if you have problems with checking on to Sermon Audio, then you can check on to the YouTube and however you do all of that stuff. If you care to watch after I say what I'm about to say, but here's what you need to understand. The Bible is fixing to give you an answer for something that's going to be real difficult. How many of you have heard the statement before, better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission? Yeah, I just saw hundreds of hands go up right there, or ten hands, however many people are watching. i got no idea. But you just saw a bunch of hands go up. You say, why? That's modern day. You know what some of you do before you even think? You turn on that social media and you respond to a bunch of foolishness or you put a bunch of garbage out there. You don't have the credentials to be able to put it out there. You go back and forth with somebody and argue over something and fuss with somebody or fight. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? Well, Romans 13 is not really Romans 13. It doesn't really apply to our situation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it's not really the same thing there when Peter's under Nero and saying to pay tax. That's not really the same thing. This and that and the other and all that kind of stuff. Hey, hey, just, just hang on a second. Let's just see what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 8, And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. You know what he just said? It's not right to do wrong to get a chance to do right. It's not right to use a a troubling, difficult time to manifest your agenda. I'm amazed at how many people right now are, quote, witnessing for Jesus Christ and never would even leave a track at a dinner table. Never would do anything. They're talking about wanting the right to gather in churches. But here's what I really think it is. They don't want you to open up the church. You want the restaurant opened and the movie theater opened. And here's going to get a lot of you. It's You want the sports arenas opened. Because you're Sunday now. But see, if we open the churches, that looks so spiritual. Open the churches. Why you ain't coming anyhow? You got a sports day. You got a fishing day. You got a hunting day. You got a day you got to kick your feet up and read the newspaper and drink the coffee. It's your only day off and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever thought that Galatians 6, 7 might apply here? That you reap what you sow? Have you ever thought maybe we took the, the ability, the opportunity, the privilege of gathering together for granted? Look at the people that are talking about it. I'm not so sure that they want the churches open as much as they want the school open. They're tired of dealing with the kids. As much as they want the restaurants open because they're losing too much weight. As much as they want the other places, the bars, and I'm sure none of you would be in those places and that like that, and the strip clubs and the sports arenas. Because Sunday is, I mean, that's a relaxing day. So we got to get back out there. Our kids aren't able to play sports on Sunday. Well, you can play them now. Well, no, they don't even let us do that, man. And so guess what happens? You have a bunch of people jumping in and on, on opening the church, but the fact is they know if they open the church, they get to go back to their sports. There it is. I know it's a bad, horrible thing because it's, I got to see your kids and your grandkids grow up and you got to see them play all their sports and you got to watch them and take the pictures and so they'll have the same picture you have on your mantle that's 40 years old and collecting dust when you didn't have a, a tool shed over your shoes and that kind of a thing. And now all of a sudden, and now all of a sudden, you're up here talking about we can't gather, we can't gather. Well, you're gathered now, aren't you? Some of you are. You're gathered together as your family. 
I'm ready to get back together here, but ladies and gentlemen, I am not, God willing, going to do wrong to get a chance to do right. You say, why? It's biblical. People ask me all the time, well, don't you think Jesus would do so and so? No, Jesus wouldn't do smoke and mirrors to get people in the church. He's not going to do wrong to get a chance to do right. You know where our church is nowadays, as, as far as I mean as an entire body? It's, well, it, you know, I can join hands with some of these people to get what I want to get and, and those kind of things. Suppose the Lord says, well, now is it right for you to walk? How shall two walk together except to be agreed? Amos 3.3. 3. You sure it's okay to join hands with those people? I know what it is. I know exactly what it is. I know on Sunday you go to your place of worship. I know before they close the doors of this church and churches across the United States of America that one of the reasons I believe the churches were closed, here we go, I'm just going to go ahead and give you an opinion, it's just my opinion, is because you were going to your own places of worship anyway. Your place of worship, where you go and spend your Sunday. In the bed. Okay, well that's fine if you work midnight shift. I get that, I understand that. I'm aware of that, I get that. But uh, teaching your kids that Sunday's just another day, Crank up the boat. Get the rifle. It's just Sunday. And now all of a sudden the Lord said, okay, well, if that's how you feel about it, we'll fix that. I'm just saying instead of blaming the world for everything, instead of blaming China, instead of blaming where it came from and what happened, which is human nature, how about if we take a look inside and read over there in the passage of Ezekiel where judgment begins at the house of God. Suppose the Lord just maybe, just maybe, just maybe is saying, you know, you didn't really make that big of a deal about it and I didn't hear you say anything about it in the first place. I saw it by your lack of participation. I know I'm over my time now, but I'll bridge the gap and I'll give you about five minutes in between and then we'll get cranked up again here and have somebody sing and get going. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand something that's going on in this country right now. The world's not responsible for where you are. You're the church. You're supposed to be separated. Just suppose you take a good look at yourself and think to yourself this morning, you know something, maybe I have taken that thing for granted. And maybe it has been just another day for me. And maybe I have been lackadaisical about it. And maybe it was the Lord that said it. Now I know we got preachers around the country saying nobody's going to keep me from meeting and all that kind of stuff and we're going to stand with them and all that other kind. Okay, that's fine for them. I, I have the grace to put up with that if that's what they want to do. I got, well, you know, brother so and so and he's doing it and brother so and so he's doing. Okay, great. That's fine. Well, what are you doing? Well, you know, our pastor won't let us meet in that kind of a thing. Okay. What are you doing? The preachers that are talking about who is and who isn't and that kind of thing. Well, do what you need to do for your church and be responsible to accept the repercussions from it. But did you ever pause? Did you ever think? Did you ever consider out of 52 weeks last year, out of 52 weeks, what Sunday morning had become to you? Did you ever think about it? I didn't say you took a Sunday off or a vacation day or something like that. I'm talking 52 weeks. Did you ever pause and think, hey, we can't go to church because we got fill in the blank? Well, I guess I just will go to the church because uh, the ball game doesn't start till 2 o'clock. And so now you're out there with an unsaved world. And you know what they do? You say, hey, why don't you come go to church with me? Well, in today Sunday? Well, yeah. Well, what's the difference in you and me? You say you go to church and it's Sunday and you're out here with me. It got real quiet right there and it's not just because the church is empty. You say, why? Because you know what our attitude is? It's okay to do wrong to get a chance to do right. No, it ain't. That's a good country word for it is not right to do wrong to get a chance to do right. When you get up to the judgment seat of Christ, I don't care how old you are, God's going to hold you accountable for what you did in your body, not everybody else. Father, bless your word and be with us this morning we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.